Okay guys, this is the uh, integrated one test number two review for the test number two that is coming up very soon. What I suggest, uh, I'm going to try to do as many problems as I can from this on this review so that you guys can study. What I suggest you guys do is uh, attempt the problems first on your own. Okay, You should always attempt the problems first on your own and then once you get stuck or you want to check your work then you can come and see my video on how I did it. Okay, So I suggest you keep pausing every time a new problem starts so that you can try it on your own first and then you can see um, you can check how it's done to see if you got it correct or if there's something you need to fix okay let's get started number one says uh, simplify five times x minus three plus y what you're gonna do what when they say simplify what they mean is two things they mean distribute and combine like terms that's what simplify means Combi uh, distribute combine like terms so we're going to first distribute there's a five right here you guys can see that 5 needs to be multiplied times the x minus 3 so we're gonna multiply it times x minus 3 like there times x and times negative 3 5 times x is 5x 5 times negative 3 is negative 15 bring down the plus y and then the next step is to check if there's any like terms so you already distributed, that's done. Simplify, remember, means distribute, combine like terms. Combine like terms means find any like terms and put them together. There are no like terms here, right? 5x, negative 15, positive y, none of them are alike, so you're done. That's your final answer right there. Okay, number two, same thing. You need to distribute the negative 2 times those two, right? Simplify, that means distribute and then combine like terms. So I'm going to start by distributing the negative 2. We're going to multiply it times that one times that one. So first let's start with the negative 2x times x squared, that's negative 2x squared. Negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 1, right? Negative times negative is positive. And then minus 5x. And then again Simplify means distribute, combine like terms. We distribute it, we brought down the negative 5x, now we check for like terms. Now there's a common mistake that people make, they think this and this is are like terms, and they are not. These two are not like terms. One is squared, the other one is just x. So since they're not, they don't have the same exponent there, they cannot get together. You're done on that one too. That's your final answer. Okay, number three solve two-fifths x minus four equals negative ten so solve an equation remember the idea the goal is to isolate the x so the first thing you're gonna do is get rid of the numbers that are farther away from the x like this one right follow the order operations backwards since this is multiplication that'll be last this, this is subtraction we're gonna get rid of this first so I'm gonna add four to both sides That'll be 2 over 5x equals negative 10 plus 4. Check your signs. This is a negative. This is a positive. You should not be adding them. Subtract them, which is 6. Keep the sign of the larger number, which is negative. 2 fifths x equals negative 6. And now I want to get rid of the 2 fifths. Remember to get rid of a fraction right here when it's multiplication. You can multiply by the reciprocal of it. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 5 halves. Because what happens is that that 5 is going to cancel, the 2's are going to cancel, so it's just going to be x. But i got to do it on the right side too. So it's going to be 5 halves times 6, negative 6. What I'm going to do with the negative 6 is I'm going to write it as a fraction, negative 6 over 1, so I could do the multiplication. So as soon as I get that done, that's my answer. It's going to be x equals 5 times 6 is 30. And 2 times negative uh, times 1 is 2. And also, it's a positive times a negative, so the sign here should be negative. Okay, so I'm going to put a negative sign right there. Oops. That should be a negative right there. Negative 30 over 2. Finish it by dividing, right? I can see that I can divide 30 over 2. 30 divided by 2 is just 15. So my final answer is going to be x equals negative 15 and that is it ok 
Okay, number four, solve 4 minus 3 eighths x equals 13. Same idea, guys. First, I'm going to subtract the 4. Subtract the 4. 4 minus 4 cancels out. So it's negative 3 eighths x equals 13 minus 4, which is 9. Negative 3 eighths x equals 9. Now I'm going to get rid of the negative 3 eighths the same way. I'm going to get multiplied by the reciprocal. So multiply by the reciprocal of negative 3 eighths, which is negative 8 thirds. Because the 8 is going to cancel the 8, the 3 is going to cancel the 3. Also, since it's negative times negative, the negative cancels. That's gone. So it's just x. On the right side, I need to do the same thing. So I need to multiply by negative 8 thirds times 9, which is what the number that I already had there. I'm going to write the 9 as 9 over 1, so I can do the multiplication. So x equals negative 8 over thirds times 9, one, uh, 9 over 1. I know it's going to be negative because it's a negative times a positive. Now I just need to multiply the numerator times the numerator, the denominator times the denominator. 8 times 9 is 72. 3 times 1 is 3. And now I divide. 3 does go into 72. The question is just how many times. Uh, if you do that division on your paper or on a calculator, you're going to get negative. Remember, still negative. Let's not forget the sign. 24. And that's your final answer. Okay, number 5. Solve 1 half times x minus 8 equals negative 6. In this one, I look at the left side and I see that there's parentheses. That means that I have to simplify the left side first. Okay, if you see parentheses, you need to distribute and then combine like terms and then try to solve it from there okay so that's where you should start I cannot just add the 8 here I can't do this you can't do that to cancel the 8 okay it doesn't work because the 8 is inside of the parentheses you need to first distribute to get rid of it so let me solve that what we're gonna do is distribute the 1 half you want the 1 half to be multiplied this number right here you want it to be multiplied times the x and times the 8, negative 8. <clears throat> what I'm going to do to distribute is I'm going to put a 1 under each one. That way I, I could multiply because it's a fraction. So when I multiply fractions, I like them both to be fractions. So 1 half times x over 1, 1 times x is 1, I mean 1x, so just x. 2 times 1 is 2. 1 times 8 is 8, 2 times 1, right? 1 times x, 2 times 1. 1 times 8, 2 times 1 is 2. On the right side, it's just negative 6. Simplify still. Continue to simplify on the left side until there's nothing left to simplify. So it's x over 2, but I know what 8 over 2 is. That's 4. right? 8 divided by 2 is just 4. Equals negative 6. And now it looks just like the problems that we already did before. So I'm going to add 4 to get rid of it. x over 2 equals negative 2. Next what I'm going to do is multiply, multiply. Notice what, what's happening here. It's x divided by 2. So if you want to do the inverse operation, the inverse of dividing by 2 is multiplying by 2. You need to multiply both sides by 2 because what happens there is that that and that are going to cancel, leaving you with just x. When you divide something by 2, and then multiply by 2, it's like you didn't multiply or divide at all, right? They cancel each other out. I got to do the same thing on the right side, so I need to multiply by 2. So 2 times the number that was already there, which is negative 2. 2 times negative 2 is just negative 4. That's your final answer. Okay, number 6. It says solve the inequality and describe the solution in a complete, I should say complete there, not complete, complete sentence. This is what people always forget to do. So we're going to solve it and then describe what the solution is. Okay, so here we go. Negative 5 is greater than 2x minus 17. You're going to solve it exactly the same way that you solve equations. First I'm going to add 17 to both sides. That leaves you with 2x on the right. On the left is negative 5 plus 17. Remember, be careful with your signs. It's a negative and a positive, so subtract them, so it's 12. 
and keep the sign of the larger number, which is positive. So 12 is greater than 2x. Next, I'm going to divide by 2 to get rid of the 2 from the 2x. That cancels it. So it's just x equals 6, because it's 12. Not equals. Let me erase that. That's a mistake that a lot of people make, and I just made it. x and then this sign, not equals. 6, right? So what this is saying is that 6 is greater than, this is the is greater than sign, 6 is greater than x. Uh, in order to read it correctly, the best thing you can do is to switch the x over to the left side, okay? Some reason, it always is easier to have the x on the left side, so to see the x on the left side. I'm going to put the x on the left and the 6 on the right. If you do that ever, where you switch the two terms from one side to the other, then you must also flip the inequality symbol. Both of these solutions are correct. 6 is greater than x. x is less than 6. They are the exact same thing. The, prop, the question is, the important part to, to remember is, what does this represent? When you say 6 is greater than x, you're saying 6 is a number that is bigger than whatever x is. So x could be 5 or 4 or 3 or 2, right? Because 6 has to be bigger than all of them. When you say x is less than 6, you're saying x is a number that has to be smaller than 6. So x could be 5 or 4 or 3 or 2. It's the same thing for both. We're going to write what it means in words like this. x is all numbers. x could be all numbers that are less than 6. That are smaller than 6. x is all numbers that are less than 6. So x could be 5 or 4, or 3, or 2, or 5.9, that's still smaller than 6. Okay, number 7 is the exact same thing, so let's get started. So it says solve the inequality describing a complete sentence. I'm going to start by subtracting 4, subtract 4, that cancels, negative 3x, 10 minus 4 is 6. Divide by negative 3, because you want to get rid of it, and this is one of those where you have to flip the inequality symbol. Why? Because you divide it by a negative. Every time you divide by a negative, you have to reverse the inequality symbol. So on the right side you have x. On the left side you have negative 2. And you're done. Once again, I don't like the x on the right side, so I'm going to switch it over to the left side. x and negative 2. But if I do that, I remember I have to flip the inequality symbol. So instead of being less than, it is now going to be greater than, like that. And that's my solution also. Both of those are the same thing. How do I say that in words? x is all numbers, all numbers that are... What is it saying? It's saying greater than negative 2, right? All numbers that are greater than negative 2. Greater than negative 2. So x could be negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, any number that is after negative 2. Number 8. Thales was an ancient philosopher familiar with similar triangles. One story about him is that he found the height of a pyramid by measuring its shadow and his own shadow at the same time. If the person here is 5 feet tall, set up a proportion to find the height of the pyramid in the picture below. So what are we trying to find? It says set up a proportion to find, find the height of the pyramid. That's x. We're trying to find the height of the pyramid. So I'm going to label it here. The height of the pyramid is x. We don't know what it is. So we're going to set up a proportion. From the picture, it should be much, much easier to see than if you just saw it words. Okay? From the picture, you can see that the height of the pyramid is x and the shadow of the pyramid is 318. The height of the person, they, they did tell me, it's not written here, I'm going to write it, is 5. Right? They told me right here. And the shadow of the person is 6. So what you have is two triangles. This triangle and this triangle and they are similar triangles which means that they you can set up a proportion for them okay so I'm gonna start by writing X which is the height of the pyramid over and I'm gonna choose a number that that makes sense to put under the X there are two numbers that make sense I could put 318 right here 
because x and 318 are both about the pyramid. It has to be two numbers that are related to each other. So I could write x over 318 because they're both about the pyramid. I could also write 5 here, and it would be okay. 5 because they're both heights. X is a height, 5 is a height. So since they're both heights, they are related to each other, I could put them both here. The only one of these that I cannot put there is 6. The 6 has nothing to do with the X. It's the shadow of a person. It is not about the pyramid. It is not about the height. So it has nothing to do with it. The only two that make sense are 318 and 5. I'm going to write uh, 318. Why? It doesn't matter which one you choose. You're going to get the same answer. Okay, But it has to be a number that is related to it. So if you're writing x, it has to be 318 or it has to be 5, not 6. Now since I chose 318, the other fraction on the other side of my proportion should match. Okay, So here's my first ratio. This is going to be another ratio. When you set them equal to each other, that's what makes it a proportion. Okay. A proportion. Whoops. That's what we mean by a proportion. Two ratios that are equal to each other. Okay, so let's uh, figure out exactly what the other side should look like. If I wrote 318, x over 318, the other side has to have this other numbers in the same order that I wrote them here. So if I'm writing height over shadow, it's got to be height over shadow also. So it's got to be 5 over 6. 6 over 5 would not make sense and it would give you the wrong answer. Okay, And now we solve it. To solve these, you're going to cross multiply. Every proportion can be solved by cross multiplying. So we're going to multiply the 6 times the x, 6x, and the 5 times the 318, like that. So 6x equals uh, 5 times 318, which is 1590. You can check that on a calculator. Divide by 6 on both sides to finish it. And so x equals 1590 divided by 6. And 1590 divided by 6 is 265. And also you can check that on a calculator. Make sure that it's correct. And that is in feet. So the height of the pyramid is 265 feet according to our calculations here. Always make sure to uh, that your number makes sense. Okay, The 265 in this case does make sense. What wouldn't make sense is if I got a number that is bigger than 318, okay, like 320, 330, 340. That wouldn't make sense because according to this, the person is shorter than the shadow, right? 5, 6. So the shadow should be longer. The, the height of the pyramid should be shorter. It would not make sense to get a number like 400, okay? The shadow must be longer. This number makes sense. It's close enough to 318, but it's not too small and it's not past it. It's not big, uh, too big. Okay, number nine, two ladders are leaning against the wall at the same angle as shown. The longer ladder is 48 feet and reaches 36 feet up the wall. The shorter ladder only reaches 12 feet up the wall. How long is the shorter ladder? Okay, so from looking at my picture, I can see that all the uh, measurements are there. Here's the longer ladder and it's the height that it reaches. Here's the shorter ladder and the height that it reaches. We're trying to find the length. How long is the shorter ladder? ladder. So we're going to call that x. This is x, the shorter ladder, the length of it. We're going to set up a proportion again, starting with x over something. So just like I mentioned before, two numbers make sense. I could put the 12 because they're both about the ladder, or I could put the 48 because they're both about the length of the ladder, not the height that it reaches. The only one that wouldn't make sense here is a 36. 36 is that about, a, about the other ladder, and it's also about the height that it reaches, not about the length. So I'm going to go with 48. Why? Just because it's the first number that I saw there. Okay, But somebody could write 12 and it would be okay. x over 48 equals, now since I did x over 48, this number over this number, my other fraction has to use these two and it has to follow the exact same pattern that I used. Short ladder over long ladder, x over 48. For the other one, 12 over 36. and you're going to cross multiply and solve. Before you do that though, notice that the 12 and the 36 have uh, um, can be reduced. It's a fraction that can be reduced, can be made easier. Make it easier for yourself because I'd rather simplify it first than have to multiply 12 times 48 and then divide by 36 which is going to be uh, a little bit tougher. We're going to simplify the 12 over 36 
we're going to get x over 48 equals 12 and 36. You can divide them both by 12, so it's 1 over 3. And now it's much easier. Cross multiply. 3x is one side, and 48 is the other. 3x equals 48. Finish it. I'm going to finish over here. 3x equals 48. Finish it by dividing both sides by 3 and you are done. 48 divided by 3 is 16. 16 feet since it's the height of a ladder. And again that number makes sense. Look, the height that it reaches is 36 but the ladder itself is longer than that, 48. So if the height that it reaches is 12 feet, the, la the ladder itself is going to be longer, 16. That makes sense. Number 10, decide the following situations would result in a continuous graph or a discrete graph. So remember, continuous means that you can keep cutting it down into smaller and smaller pieces. So that means that you can connect the dots. Discrete means that there's only certain amounts that it could be. So it's discrete. So for A, the amount of money in your bank account over time. Money is most of the time going to be continuous because it can grow by decimal points. Okay, so it, we're going to say continuous. However, there is an argument to be made for discrete on this one. Somebody could say discrete if they say, well, if I just keep de depositing the exact same amount every month or every week, then it's going to be discrete, right? Let's say I only deposit $20 into my account per week. Then the first week is going to have $20. The second week is going to be 40 60 uh, 80 and so on. If I keep doing that only uh, depositing the same amount per week, then it's going to be discrete. Right? But if I just leave it and I could put in whatever amount I want and it's growing by some percentage because it's gaining interest, then it's going to be continuous. Okay, part B. The grade on a test based on the number of problems correct. This one's going to be discrete. Because the number of problems on the test is a set number, right? There's one or two or three or four or five or six or however many there are on the test. So however many you get correct determines your your test score. It's going to be discrete. It's just a bunch of points that determine your score. The height of a tree over time, part C, the height of a tree over time. That one should be obvious to you guys. That one's continuous. You measure the tree today and it might be five feet tall. You measure it in a week and it might be 5.03 feet tall, right? So it might change by a tiny little bit. You could cut it down into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, D, the amount of profit made from each car sold. There's an argument to be made from both on this one as well. Oh, I didn't have a rotor here. So, or it could also be discrete, depending on how you explain it. Same thing for D. Could be continuous. The amount of profit made from each car sold. It could be continuous if you're going to a dealership where you can haggle with the dealer and then they make you a deal and say yeah, I'm gonna cut off 10% of the of the cost of the car or something right so they could cut down the amount of money into smaller and smaller pieces if they want to or you can say well you know what what if the car is has a set price and the amount of profit that they make is the exact same for every single car because they're only selling the same type of car at the same price then you could say it's discrete because you could say I could sell one car and make five thousand dollars two cars and make ten thousand dollars and so on right if that's the case, then it's going to be discrete. So it depends on what the situation or the specific situation is, but it could be both. E, the number of songs each student has in their iPod. That one is definitely discrete. If you're t talking about the number of songs, there is a set number of songs that you could have. One or two or three or four, not uh, 1.5 or 1.7, right? Those are always going to be set numbers. So the discrete is correct. Okay, number 11. Given the explicit rule f of n equals 5n plus 6, uh, what is the 6 representing in this rule and what is the 5 representing in this rule? First, I want to show you guys real quick the explicit rule that we know and tell you guys what each number represents. Explicit rule. And then there's another way of writing it, which is the way that they're writing it right here on this problem. Okay? So the explicit rule that we know goes like this, f of n equals f of 1 plus d times n minus 1. And in this uh, rule, f of 1 
represents the first term, and d represents the common difference. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. f of 1 is the first term. First term in your sequence. And d is the common difference. Common difference. That's it for that one. Now, there is another way to write it, which is the way that they wrote it right there. If they wrote it in this form, then it looks like this. Use a different color so you guys can see the difference. f of n equals d times n plus f of 0. That's what that one looks like right there. Okay? And that is this. Where they all they did basically is they took our original explicit rule and they distributed d. So it's d times n and then negative d. So it's f of 1 minus d, which means f of 0. f of 1 minus the common difference means that you took your first term and you went backwards to find the term before that. The term before the first term is the 0th term, or f of 0. Okay, So that's what that one looks like. Uh, that is another way of writing the explicit rule. I'm going to write real quick right here what each one means. f of uh, d represents the common difference still. Common difference. And f of 0 represents the term before the first term. It, you could call it the 0th term, but that doesn't really make sense. That's not a word. The term before the first term. Most many many times we just decide to call it the initial or beginning point. The initial or beginning, right? The one right before the first term. So the first term uh, uh, is not the is not where it begins. It begins before that at the zeroth term, the term before the first term. So that's the idea. This is the one we're used to seeing a lot. If they distribute the, the d, the common difference, they get this. Okay. So if you see it in this form, d still d, the common difference, it's next to n, but the other number that is by itself is f of 0, the 0th term. So now with that, we can answer the questions here. What is the 6 representing in this rule? Notice that it's there at the end. That is f of 0. That's what we're going to write. It represents f of 0 which is, you could also say in words, the term before the first term. The term, term before the first term. You could also say the initial or beginning point. Okay, All of those would be correct, but I'd, li I'd rather, I'd have, I'd, I like f of 0 better and the term before the first term, instead of saying the initial or beginning because if you say that, you could also say, well, f of 1 was the beginning, was the initial. So I'd rather see f of 0 or the term before the first term. What is the 5 representing in this rule? If you look at it, here's the 5 compared to this. That's d. If it's being multiplied by n, it's d, right? In the explicit rule that we know, and in this one also, it's still d. The common difference. common difference. Okay, using the knowledge from the last problem, we can now answer these questions um, easily. Which of the following rules have the same common difference? Just look at each one. The common difference here is 2. The common difference here is 3. The common difference here is 5. The common difference here is 3. Which ones have the same common difference? These two. B and D. If they ask instead which ones have the same uh, f of 0, the same term before the first term, you would say these two, right? f of 0 is the same in this two. But the same common difference is b and d. Done. 15. Identify the common difference in each of the following explicit rules. f of n equals 6n plus 1, f of n equals 4n plus 3, f of n equals 2n plus 5. The common difference. The common difference is the number next to the n. So for this one, number uh, a, d is 6. For b, D is 4, and for C, D is 2. That's the common difference for each one. And the other number, remember, this is not F of 1, this is F of 0, right? the term before the first term, because they are not writing it in the form that we're used to.
14. Write an expression to model each of the following situations. A monthly fee of 65 plus a $45 initiation fee. So a monthly fee of 65, that's 65M. I'm going to say M represents the number of months. Monthly fee, so every month they're charging you 65. 65M plus 45 initiation fee, so plus 45. Initiation fee means that you only pay it once, so that's it. 65M plus 45. B, an hourly wage of 950. Hourly, 950. So you are going to make 950 per hour. So you're going to write 950. H, H will stand for the number of hours. Okay, 950 H plus uh, $150 stipend, which means that they only give you that amount one time and that's it. So 950 per hour plus 150, that gives you the total. C, a startup fee of 50 plus a $12 weekly fee. So a startup fee of 50, that's just 50. Since it's a startup fee, that means that they only charge it once. Plus $12 weekly. So 12, W, W will stand for the number of weeks. And D, a charge of 0 0.5 per minute. That's 5 cents per minute plus a $1.50 connection fee. So 5 cents per minute, 0.5 M, 0.05 M. M stands for the number of minutes plus 150 connection fee. And you only get that one, so you don't have to multiply that times anything. That's it. 15. Brian is driving at 100 kilometers per hour. What is Brian's speed in miles per hour? Round your answer to the nearest hundreds. So first, let's investigate what they gave us. They gave us kilometers per hour. Kilometers per hour. And they want miles per hour. All right, so we want to go from kilometers per hour to miles per hour. So it's already in hours, right? They already gave me hours. What I need to change is the kilometers to miles. And they gave me this conversion factor. So what you need to convert is just kilometers to miles. So we're going to start with what we have, which is 100 and 100, exactly 100, 100 kilometers. And we're going to convert to miles over X miles. You could also put the X on top and say it's X miles over 100 kilometers. Doesn't matter where you put the X, you're going to get the same answer. Okay, so 100 kilometers over X miles. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it equal to my conversions uh, factor that they gave me to this, basically. And I'm going to solve it using a proportion, just like we have been doing for all of those conversions. 100 kilometers over X miles. So since I'm doing kilometers over miles, what I need to put here is two numbers that I know for sure to be true, and it has to be kilometers over miles also, which is basically these two numbers. 1.61 kilometers, one mile. And that's how I got to do the conversion. These cross, cross multiply. So x times 1.61 is 1.61 x. 100 times 1 is 100. Divide by 1.61. Divide by 1.61. x equals 100 divided by 1.61. Do that calculation on your calculator. My calculator says 62. Now it says round your answer to the nearest hundredths place. That's two decimal places, right? Tens, hundredths. So 62.11 is what my calculator says. 0.11. What is this? Remember what we were doing. We were changing kilometers to miles. So <clears throat> this is going to be miles. Per hour, right? 62 miles per hour. That is Brian's speed in miles per hour if he's driving 100 kilometers per hour. And you're done. 16. Fernando can run 1 mile in 4.5 minutes. What is his speed in miles per hour? So what did they give me in this case? They gave me miles.